Amen. Good morning. How are you all this morning? I am glad you're doing well. We're glad that you're here. When you, Father God, thank you so much for the blessing of another day to experience your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and the fullness of life that you have promised us. We pray, Lord, that you would just help us right now in the busyness of life to just stop. To just let go of all of the concerns, of all of the responsibilities for just a moment. Because they pale in comparison to your awesome presence that we have entered into now. Where two or three are gathered in your name, you have said you will be there every time. And so we have gathered here today to worship you, Lord, to lift your name on high. To call out what we have seen and experienced in our own lives through song, through testimony, through participation in a time of worship of you. That's what it's all about. It's not about us. It's all about you, Lord. So we come to lift your name on high. We come to enter into your holy, awesome presence. You are a holy God. And you have called us to be a holy people set apart for your purpose. Allow this time right now to be a time that we have set ourselves apart for you. To worship you and to focus on you. The world will be waiting for us when we finish. But right now, Lord, we enter into your presence to focus on you. May you be blessed and glorified by it. We ask these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. First John. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this, in a, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. 
This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. He is the light of the world, and we're here to worship him today. Let's sing together. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship and to praise you today, Father, we thank you that you are on the throne and that you are worthy of worship. And thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together and just to worship you. We pray now, Lord, that you might bless the gifts today, that they might be used to glorify you and to spread your word throughout our world. For we do ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Many of you will remember a young man named Cameron Labar, who grew up in our church, and um, uh, he went off to uh, further his education and got his doctorate in music, and now he is um, a professor at at a college in Springfield. Um, He married a young lady named Susan, and uh, she was also very gifted in music. And she is the one who arranged the piece that we're about to do today. So Susan Labar, um, we're going to do a piece called Gather at the River.
as we continue our series on Do You Believe, I wonder, have you ever considered your belief to be measured in a quantity? Not only do you believe, but how much do you believe? How would we measure how much we believe? What would we use as, as the instrument for measurement? Well, I, I would uh, present to you today the idea that it revolves around the choices we make in relation to our belief. We face choices on a daily basis that truly do re reveal the level of our belief. I want you to watch this clip as a couple struggle with each other's level of belief. Watch this. They say I acted outside of my capacity. And if the union scene is backing my actions, they'll be liable too. So, unless I apologize, they're cutting me loose. Apologize? I can't. Not for sharing Jesus with a dying man. And especially since they're looking to turn this into some kind of an example. So to prove a point, you're willing to risk everything? I'm not trying to prove a point. I'm trying to be faithful. And you were. The guy is safe in heaven now, thanks to you and Jesus. End of story. Sure, he is. What about the next guy? I spoke with Tom's friend, Steve Katz. He's willing to represent me, but he's asking for a retainer. 20,000. Where are we gonna get that kind of money from, Bobby? We have one month's mortgage in our checking account and all of our cards are maxed out. I don't know, but I trust God will provide a way. Bobby, we're not in church. I need to know where the money's gonna come from. Especially when you insist on tithing on every nickel we make. Tell me. Where is it going to come from? I can't do this anymore. What do you want me to do? Sign the statement. Apologize. Do whatever they want you to do. Or what? Or what, Elena? level of our belief. How much do we believe? How far are we willing to go based on the belief that we claim? The choices we make on a daily basis can reveal to us how much we truly believe. Now we tend to be a people who want to actively be in control of our lives. And that's part of what we saw in that scene there. The idea of not being in control can cause us to enter into crisis. To, to go to a place that we're unsure of. Normally, we do not stand by passively and allow someone else to direct our paths. Granted, some of us enjoy allowing other people to make decisions for us because we think it takes some of the pressure off of us. But in reality, very, very few of us like the idea that someone else is in control of our lives. We want to know what's going to happen. We want to know how it's going to play out. We want to be in control. We want security. And when we find security, we hold on to it very, very tightly. This morning, we're going to look at a character from the Bible who was also very much like that, very much holding on to his security. 
you'd open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, we want to read a story that Jesus tells about a situation that arose in a young man who had to make a decision based on his level of belief and based on his sense of security and control. Mark chapter 10 will begin with verse 17 if you'll follow along as I read. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus felt love for him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me but at these words he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was not for he was one who owned much property and jesus looking around said to his disciples how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of god the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, With people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Would you pray with me? Father God, right now, take your word and implant it within us. Open our hearts and minds to receive what it is you have to say to us today. You brought each and every one of us here for a purpose. Lord, though no one else may know we're here at this moment, you do. And you brought us here specifically to show us something about our lives and about who you are. So let us see clearly let us hear attentively to what it is that you have for us today. And let us not leave here the same as we arrived. For we know we are in the awesome, perfect, powerful presence of Almighty God. And it is to you we give honor and glory this day. And we ask these things in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I want to draw your attention to a few things in this passage. In this encounter Jesus has with this rich young man. Number one, I want you to see what Jesus omitted from the list that he gave this young man. This young man comes rushing up. There is some urgency. It says as Jesus was getting ready to depart, this man came running up and knelt before him and says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
There is an urgency in this young man. But I want you to notice in the list that Jesus gives here at the beginning of this story what he omits from mentioning. He does not mention, you shall have no other gods. You shall have no other gods. He doesn't mention that you shall make no graven images. He omits from the list, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. And he leaves out, remember the Sabbath. Why? If you look at these, you will notice that these are all the commandments that deal with our relationship with God. Relationships are a funny thing. It takes two. My relationship with you, your relationship with me. Without either of us, the whole thing is impossible. Oh, sometimes we may think we have a relationship with someone. But knowing about someone is not a relationship. You know, some of you I, I know fairly well. Some of you I know a little bit. The difference is, it, normally it's the time we spend together. But I find it interesting that what Jesus leaves off the list are the commands about the relationship with God. About the encounter that we're to have with the creator of all the universe. Keeping that in mind, let's look at point number two here. What did Jesus list? The young man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? After Jesus gives him a little insight that most don't pick up, because remember when the man came, do you remember what he said? He said, good teacher. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. There's two major things that are said in that statement. Number one, we, you and I, we are not good. A lot of times the world wants to try and convince us that deep down, everybody's good. That's a lie. We're not. We're born with the nature of sin. We lean toward what is wrong as opposed to what is right. But the second thing is, he reveals to this man, if the man would listen, none is good but God, and you said it, good teacher, I am. But Jesus responds, and what does he list? Well, he says, don't murder. It's a task, it's an action. It has a little to do with relations. But in the way that it was being used by the Israelites, it was simply a law. It wasn't focused on the relationship. Jesus tried to refocus it. He said, you have, you have heard you shall not commit murder, but I tell you if you look at your brother with anger, you've already sinned in your heart. See, they had made it into a task. He said, don't commit adultery. They had increased the laws and they had increased the actions and they had, as we have done in our society today, we have gotten to the point where we're willing to accommodate this law, this command, this idea. We find many ways around it, many justifications. But God's desire is that we find a person to unite with for the rest of our lives. That we're faithful and committed to. And that we don't need anything else. 
He also lists don't steal. You should be satisfied with what you have. Don't lie. Well, why shouldn't we lie? Well, the main reason is because God is truth. Don't lie. Don't defraud. Don't, don't try and want what someone else has. Don't try, and, don't try and make it look like something different. And then he says, honor your father and mother. You see, this list that Jesus gives this young man, these are tasks for us to live out. They're duties, they're tasks of how we should live, of what we should do. Now, for many of us, we look at these two lists and it's easy to understand. This is the easier one to handle. If you've got clear-cut boundaries of how you're supposed to operate and what you're supposed to do, it's a whole lot easier than how you relate with other people, isn't it? You want to know how well you get along with someone? Get in a car and drive for three days. Now, the driving part, you can get the directions. You can have, you can have uh, the GPS tell you where to go, or you can print them out from the computer, or you can look on a map, and you can line it all out. You can have all the hotels planned of where you're stopping and, and have that taken care of. You can take care of all the tasks, but it's the hours in the car that become the challenge. Oftentimes, and, and sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. Those of you who are uh, mothers of young children, you know this. Part of the tasks is coming up with enough things to keep them busy for three days. And so rather than the relate, working on the relationship, we work on having the uh, car bingo and having the movies and having the, the music and having the, the toys and having the etch-a-sketch and, and, you know, there's no room for clothes. The difference between tasks and relationships is a big one. But then Jesus makes a statement here, and point number three that I need to draw your attention to is this. What Jesus said was the greatest. He tells this young man what he must do. He leaves out the commandments about relationship with God. But then he makes this statement. What Jesus said was the greatest... The first is love the Lord your God. Now that doesn't just relate to that list that he left off. That relates to a whole lot more. That relates to relationships. Not just the relationship with God, but the relationship with others. Because how do you love God? And that's the second point of what he says is the greatest. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, what Jesus wants us to understand in this passage is how to put these things together. Rather than trying to put God in this box of what must I do to be saved, rather than to put God in a box that fits and gives us boundaries on how we should live, Jesus wants us to look at the big picture. He wants us to see the full tapestry of life. And so this is how the two work together in our lives. We are to rely on God, not self. See, in the two lists that we had, the first list involves relying on God. The second list involves relying on self. But to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself changes the dynamics. And we've got to rely on God for that and not self. And the second way that these two work together, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, 
is to take care of, the, take care of others. In this passage, especially the poor. Jesus tells this young man, one thing, one thing you lack. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were only one thing that we lacked in how we live our lives? That's what Jesus told this young man, one thing. If you can get this one thing taken care of, you're going to be in good shape. Now let me tell you something. Odds are in your life and in my life there is one thing. It may impact a whole host of things about the way we live, but it is based on one area of our life that we haven't let go of. And it was the same way in this young man's life. This is where the decision came. The rich young man was not willing to give up his security and give away his treasure. Let me restate that. The rich young man was not willing to give up his security and give away his treasure. What am I meaning here? Here's the reality of it. For this young man, he had much property and much wealth. It wasn't whether or not he could live without it. It was whether or not he would feel secure without it. That's why Jesus left off the list of the relationship with God. Because this man did not rely on God. He relied on himself. There wasn't anything that he couldn't take care of for himself because he had great wealth. Now you may be sitting here and saying, well, great, Pastor, but that doesn't apply to me. You haven't seen my bank account. I don't have to see your bank account. There are things each one of us hold on to as security. And it may not be wealth. There's a host of things that it may be. But I want you, I want you to catch something here in this passage, and that's Roman numeral number four, and that is what Jesus promises what Jesus promises. Now this isn't a maybe. This isn't a possibly. Jesus makes a promise. And you know, as well as I know, that God keeps his promises. Every single time. Two things that he promises. Number one, you will have treasure in heaven. Well, great, but that doesn't buy the bread. You will have treasure in heaven. For all of eternity, Jesus promises, if you will let go and rely on God and help take care of others, you will have treasures in heaven. But just in case you don't catch the whole picture here, he also says in verses 29 through 31, you will receive a hundredfold now in this life. Now part of the challenge in that statement is how we measure things. As I was reading this to you a minute ago, as we were reading it together, I don't know what, what stood out for you or what you caught in this little section of... Uh, you will experience a hundredfold return. Um, but, but I'm fine with the brothers and sisters that I have. I really don't need any more. Even though he gives a little promise there. And uh, I, I know my wife would not uh, have a desire to have any more houses because one is plenty to keep up with. But now we're trying to put God in a box again, aren't we? Well, I gave $100, so God, I, 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 I really, really need to see $10,000 return.
we need to grasp what God desires to do in your life and why He desires to do that. He does make a promise that you will have treasure in heaven and you will receive a hundredfold. But let me ask you a question. Before, before you start evaluating whether God has been faithful to that promise in your life right now, to this point, let me ask you a question. Under what circumstances have you given? Under what circumstances have you followed what Jesus is asking of this young man? See, Jesus' promise is the outcome of putting it all together. Not just taking pieces and parts. Not just taking the list and fulfilling this list or those tasks. It's putting the whole picture together in our lives and living it out. And that's when we will experience the fullness of this promise that we're given. So what about you and I? Let's put it to where we are today. Let's make this personal because that's what God desires to do. Where is our security? Where is your security? Is it in a relationship? Is it in the tasks? Or have we made it work together? See, here's, here's part of our problem. We, we tend to be extremes. We tend to be at the extremes in so many things in our life. You know, right now we're either a red state or a blue state. I'm sick of it. The flag is red, white, and blue. Let's start learning to get along and do what's right and what's best. But it's not just in the politics of our nation. We do the same thing within the church. You know, to the, to the people outside of especially the Southern Baptist denomination, do you know the reputation we have? We have the reputation of the list that Jesus did give this guy. We're the church of all the things that you're not allowed to do. We've got all the rules. Can't dance, can't drink, can't spit, can't chew. What's the last part? You can't date, date girls or you do. You know, we've got, we've got this list. That's how people oftentimes view us. There are other groups out there who are trying to follow Jesus, but, but they've taken the approach of, of it's all about the relationship with God, and so I don't have to do anything. You know, when, when Jesus came and died on the cross, and when he conquered death and, and returned to heaven, he took care of it all, and he did away with, with half of this book, that old part. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We just have to worry about the relationship. We have to love and just all get along. Well, let me tell you, both are wrong. Both are sin within the church. Jesus is saying you've got to bring it together. Is the relationship between you and God of utmost importance? Absolutely. But so is the way you choose to live your life now. Murder is still wrong. Why? Because God created life and he values it. How dare you? How dare you take something that God created and put it to an end? And I include not only someone else's, but your own. That is not an option. But it's got to be both and. It's got to be the relationship being of utmost importance and the living it out in the tasks that we do on a daily basis. It's putting those together. You see, we, and, and it is about security. We tend to, to gravitate toward one of those extremes because we want security. 
We want to know that we've got it taken care of. Have you made it work together? If so, how is it seen in our lives? How is it revealed? You know, that's, that's part of what this series is talking about. It's not just the belief here, but how is it lived out? How is it revealed in how you have lived your life? We've talked about that a lot lately. I want us to be a revelation to the world of who God is in our lives. How we live daily should reveal that to other people. It's about our relationships. It's about the tasks and how we live. Does it all belong to God? Or do we use it for the benefit of the kingdom? Or do we hold on tightly to some things? Because we need security. What do you treasure? What in your life are you holding on to? A treasure that may bring a little bit of security. You see, I have an assignment for you today. This is not going to be another normal Sunday. This is a little different. And I have an assignment for you. It's a kingdom assignment. And it is for every single individual in this sanctuary right now. Some who aren't here this morning may be able to get on YouTube or the website and watch and listen and take this assignment on upon themselves as well. But specifically, it was for every individual in this room right now. I have a kingdom assignment for you if you choose to accept it. I want to challenge you during the next 90 days to find a personal item of value or treasure and sell it. A personal, not ladies, it's, it's not some of his things out in the garage that need to be gotten rid of already. That's not what we're talking about. Because we're talking about security. Find an item of personal value or treasure and sell it. Together we're going to make a testimony to the world about the kingdom of God. It is not the monetary value of this item that is of importance. It is your willingness to let it go. So this needs to be something you pray about. What is it that you have been holding on to? A sense of can't let go. It may not have a whole lot of monetary value to anyone else. But if you're holding on to it and it is security, it is blocking your relationship to be full and powerful in God's presence. It is our willingness to let go of it. Maybe we need to let it go because we place too much value on it. We think it does have a monetary value and so we're not willing to let it go because maybe someday. Maybe we need to let it go because we've come to rely on it for our security. Each one of us must pray about what this item is. This assignment is not just an attempt to raise support and raise money. This is a step of faith that I'm asking you to take during the next 90 days. It is first about our determination of where our security lies and who or what we place our trust in. We will take all of the proceeds. We will set up a designated account. We will take all of the proceeds from this, every penny, and use them to help take care of the poor this Christmas. I don't know exactly how that's going to look yet. God does. I don't know what we're going to have to work with. But here's what I, here's what I will say. I think we're going to have to come up with more ways to minister to the poor this Christmas than what you can imagine right now. Because if you will take this assignment that I believe God is giving us, you don't have a clue as to what God's going to bring in as a result of this.
and what God's going to do with it. This isn't just about raising money to help the poor, to help the needy. We will do that. But folks, I want you to take this assignment to help you. To allow you to recognize where is my security and trust? Is it in myself? Is it in the things that I hold on to? Or is it in God? And can we put this together in a relationship with God and how we live it out? I believe we can. November 15th, you might want to write that down. November 15th will be Proclamation Sunday. To hear the testimonies of treasures sold and reveal the riches we as a church will use to minister to the poor this Christmas. Now, you don't have to wait until November 15th to shout it out. Over the course of the next 90 days, as God works in your life, and again, it isn't about the monetary value that you get from whatever it is that you sell. I'm not interested in the monetary value. What I'm interested in is what God is doing in your life. And we want to hear about that. So over the course of the next 90 days, I'm going to ask you to watch what God is doing as you take on this kingdom assignment. And we want to hear some testimonies from week to week about what God is doing. Maybe it's about how you chose what that item was that you were going to let go of. Maybe it was about how God took care of it. You know, some of the things that you're holding on to, nobody wants. And yet, when you commit to God and you put it up and you're willing to let go of it, God will find a way to take care of it. Let's see what God has in mind for your life, for the life of our church, and for what He's going to do with us. Will you accept this kingdom assignment? Will you pray about what you will give up for the kingdom? How big do you think our God is? That's going to be revealed over the next 90 days. What will be the total amount of resources that we will have to use come November 15th? I don't have a clue. I believe my God is a big God. And we're going to have to come up with more ways to help the poor than what we might naturally think. Because God will bless us beyond our wildest dreams. So that's my question for you this morning. Will you accept this kingdom assignment? Please understand. This is not something you are compelled to do. But I would encourage you to pray seriously about it. Some of you know right now God is telling you, you need to be a part. You need to see what God's going to do with this in your life and in the life of your church. So you're ready to make that commitment right now. Some of you may need to pray a little bit about it. Because it needs to be your wholehearted decision to do it. Don't do it because I'm standing here asking. Don't do it because you think somebody's going to watch and see what you do. Do it for your benefit. And do it for the benefit of the kingdom of God. Will you accept this kingdom assignment today? It is your choice and your choice alone. Let's pray. Father God, give us wisdom and discernment in this moment. This moment of decision. Each and every one of us in this room faces a decision right now as to whether we will choose to participate in the kingdom assignment that you have set before us, Lord. To reveal your presence and your power. To reveal your fulfillment of promise that you have given to us. Lord, I pray that you would give us courage and boldness to step forward and say, yes, I will accept this assignment. Now, Lord, I also know that right now, right here, there are some who are saying, I don't understand. 
And the reason that they might not understand is because there's a bigger decision, a bigger assignment that you have for them. And that is that right now, they need to make a public profession of their faith in you. They need to accept what Jesus did on the cross and receive the gift that you have given through your one and only Son and accept the forgiveness of the sin in their life and allow Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. And that's a bigger assignment for those who are here this morning that need to take that assignment. I pray that you would give them courage and call them out right now. That they would accept that gift. For the rest of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, I pray that we would seriously consider taking this kingdom assignment and seeing what you're going to do through it. Call us now, Lord. In this time of invitation, call us out to respond to whatever assignment you have for us now. Let us be counted. Let us be seen. That you might be revealed. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we again want to thank you for this day that we could come together to be able to study and worship and sing praises unto you. We pray, dear Lord, that you'll be able to move in our minds and in our hearts to understand what that security would be that we're willing to um, give up at this time. And may uh, we do some thinking about this and praying about it and uh, rely upon you. Holy Spirit to guide us in this direction. For your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll sing together. Oh, victory.